Hi, everybody. My name is Metallian Conde, and I am joining you from New York City in the United States. And it's my pleasure this morning to be part of this fireside chat with Rashad Robinson, president of Color of Change. I am the founding CEO of a nonprofit called AI for the People. And our mission is to increase the representation of Black technologists within the public interest sector by 2030. And we do that through a variety of ways, including high level consultations. We work with journalists and uh, filmmakers and um, other creative professionals to really advance this idea that tech is not neutral. And in actual fact, tech is in many cases anti-Black. So without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Rashad and um, really kick us off to what I think, what I hope is going to be an inspiring and as much as we can make it fun conversation, but one that really looks at technology through that angle. So my first, my first question to you, Rashad, is really about the entry point in which you came to this. Uh, I've made films about science and technology since 1998, but it really wasn't until 2012 when George Zimmerman surveilled Trayvon Martin that I began to become interested in technology. And that's because in my prior life as a documentary filmmaker, I had read about reports of facial recognition tests, like the one in 2002 for the Super Bowl, and really quite frankly thought it was nonsense. Really thought, you know, this would never happen. This is science fiction. And it wasn't until I really leaned into uh, the coding movement as a parent, I have two young boys, um, that, I, and then I started to work opposite Google that I realized that this might impact them in a negative way. Could you let us know a little bit about how Color of Change, first of all, started? I think that's really interesting, but how you got to this tech accountability. So great, first of all, it's great to be with you. It's great to be with all of you um, at um, RightsCon. i sad that we can't be together, but in so many ways, the um, crisis that we are in the middle of, um, which has in so many ways exposed all um, different aspects of systemic racism, you know, has allowed me to go to a lot more places than I would have to go otherwise if I had to get on a plane. And so I'm joining you from uh, Eastern Long Island right now um, and um, and want to talk a little bit about Color of Change and how we found it and sort of respond to, to res kind of respond to the question around our founding is you know, we were founded in the aftermath of a flood, uh, which was Hurricane Katrina about 15 years ago now. Uh, it was started by bad decision makers and turned into a life altering disaster by bad decision makers. Black people were on their roofs begging for the government to do something and they were left to die. And um, the thing that's important, I think, about Katrina that gets to sort of how we uh, think about our theory of change across all sectors of our work, but also how we think about technology, is that um, at the end of the day, like Katrina illustrated things that people already knew, geographic segregation, generational poverty, the impacts of what we've done to our planet, the ways in which structural racism undergirds all of those things. And at the heart of Katrina, no one was nervous about disappointing Black people. And when institutions are not nervous about disappointing your community, it doesn't matter what kind of research report you have that illustrates all the facts and figures. It doesn't matter what you do in the courts if you don't have the power to implement it. It doesn't matter what you build in Silicon Valley because you can't sort of code your way out of systemic racism. And so part of the sort of theory of change, of color of change, was how do we channel the presence that Black people have in the world, the visibility, the awareness, into the power to actually change the rules, to force those in power to be nervous about disappointing us, and and that goes across Silicon Valley, Hollywood, Wall Street, Capitol Hills, both in states and federally, and so many other sort of aspects of life that impacts Black people and aspects of power. And so, you know, from the very beginning as an, e as an organization that started with a single email to about a thousand people and inviting them to join this movement, we very much have um, sort of relied on and believed in the power of an open internet and fought very hard around net neutrality 
reality to protect it, not just sort of as a sort of theoretical human rights issue, not as an actual practical human rights issue, but as a civil rights issue with a very specific context here in the United States about the ability of people to be heard, counted, and visible, uh, regardless of whether they're privileged or vulnerable, majority or minority, or in favor or out of favor with those who are in power. But we got to sort of this um, technology work, this work around policing, surveillance, tech, from the very early pieces, because we've always had a real focus on corporate accountability, on um, sort of the ability to be free um, inside of a democracy, ability to be treated equal. And so whether it was dealing with issues of things like stingrays that were put out side of protest, which were capturing sort of unlawfully all sorts of um, sort of uh, conversations and um, and uh, surveilling um, uh, movements of Black activists um, to sort of the ways in which we were being doxxed on platforms and not um, and those platforms not being held accountable to facial recognition. At each phase, these sort of issues sit at the intersection of sort of our rights inside of a democracy, corporate power and the relationship to corporations, and sort of um, the sort of day-to-day -day sort of rules, whether they be policy or whether they be unwritten rules that impact Black people's lives. And so technology has been a through line and a real through line from the very beginning uh, which was Hurricane Katrina, which in so many ways animated all of the ways in which like disinvestment, targeting, exploitation of Black people sort of puts us in harm's way. And out of that, building a powerful infrastructure that could hold those who made those decisions accountable and create a new set of rules um, for how they have to do business. all of that i agree with all of that and where i would really like to start this conversation is not with uh, advanced technological systems even though i would like us to get there later on in the context of policing but more about this idea that there were a thousand people that you sent this email and you somehow had to capture that imagination i remember working at the bbc in 2005 and seeing those uh, pictures and really wondering you know, what was wrong with the United States? I think people from outside of the States think anti-Black racism is something that's unique to this country. And of course, we know being at RightsCon that that's really not the case. So where I want to get to is some of the strategies that the Color of Change have used in policing specifically to capture our imagination around policing and how we're using media and popular culture to change our views um, of policing and then kind of lead into more of more specifically about your work in that area. So, yeah, I mean, we do a lot of work in Hollywood and, you know, one reason why that is so important is because the cultural images and the stories end up shaping the reality that people have about the system. And so for the last 20 years in this country, violent crime has basically steadily went down basically steadily went down. According to Pew Research and others, Americans believe violent crime is going up. And so we have a gap between perception and reality that is deeply fueled by a whole set of incentive structures that happen on our sort of corporate media airwaves. We recently published a report in January um, called Normalizing Injustice, which looked at the crime procedural, the crime TV shows, the scripted shows like Law and Order and CSI and others, and sort of their representation of race and their representation of crime. As it related to sort of the sort of role of technology, these shows do actually a tremendous disservice day in and day out of normalizing the type of illegal, um, unconstitutional surveillance, almost creating a world where the ends justify the means, that they're going to violate someone's First Amendment rights, but they caught the bad guy. And so everyone um, was kept safe. These shows are are supported sort of on the back end by all sorts of sort of law enforcement and uh, intelligence um, experts who end up being paid consultants on these shows. Um, these shows then reach millions upon millions of people. So right, undoing the kind of day in day out context of these shows with an op-ed piece or a documentary is almost untenable because what we've done is we've created a world in which um, people see privacy uh, fundamentals of our sort of uh, data security and our sort of um, our, our kind of daily movements being violated 
um, but they see it, it dramatized in ways up against a sort of threat that makes it seem like it's okay to violate those rights because their people are being kept safe. And then maybe the rights that are there are kind of sort of inconvenient to the sort of larger threat of, of violence from a sort of black or brown or sort of foreign force. Um, and we can throw our constitution out the window. And part right. of what we've been doing is working to push back against those shows, working to create sort of a new sort of understanding, a new sort of uh, um, uh, kind of system of how about how, how these shows tell stories. And so now that we're in this, we're, you know, we're in this mess. So for example, until I read your report, I would have said one of my favorite shows was Law and Order SVU or SUV. I don't, I don't know. But yeah, then that's also, it, that's you know, ultimately, I'm thinking this is actually a terrible show that is that is about sexual crime, and maybe I need a therapist, and maybe I need to examine myself. But what the reason I'm so interested in that is in this moment where policing, for the first time at least in in my lifetime, which is relatively short, because Black people in the United States have fought against carceral control since you know, for 401 years that when Africans came to this country and were enslaved, they resisted and they're on it. That's the history on which that advocacy is built. But I'm really curious that as Color of Change was getting involved with conversations uh, about defunding the police and conversations about reimagining the way that we think about public safety uh, in response to the extrajudicial killing of George Floyd. And of course, since George Floyd, Aben Arbery has died, and even prior, just prior to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, an African-American woman, had been killed in her own home, where the police went in like a cop-style raid. It looked like, t it sounded like TV, and assassinated this woman, and we're still waiting for justice on that. But I'm wondering, as Color of Change is doing some of this work around changing the way we think about police and th changing the way we think about a technological police form. How did these images inform and what strategies did you guys use to bring us back to the reality that crime is falling and we have fundamental rights that need to be protected, even if they're being abused by agents of the state? Well, I think it's actually really important that we redefine what policing is, because I think that we've gotten this idea that uh, where there is police, there is safety. And that's actually not the case. I mean, if if a, the presence of a lot of policemen, a lot of safety, like folks would spend all their time feeling deeply safe in some of the poorest, most challenged communities where there are a lot of police. Um, what ends up happening is, is that we substitute police in certain communities, particularly black and brown communities, for the things that we know actually make communities whole, which is investment in economics, investment in schools, investment in healthcare, investment in the things that make communities fully safe. You know, where there are a lot of police, there ends up being a lot of police violence. And much like the conversation around guns, I don't believe that we can actually deal with gun violence with just a bunch of impotent gun laws. We actually have to um, remove guns. We have to downsize the number of guns. And so unless we are downsizing the number of police and actually right-sizing the investments in communities, we're not going to get to a new sense of safety and justice in our communities. And I think that that um, sort of how is how I really think about it. You know, this is sort of not just about how do we make the system work better? I hear people say that on AI. I hear people say that about policing. If we can just do better training, we can sort of make things sort of better. But, you know, here's the thing. When I was in the final phases back in 2013 of getting Fox TV network to cancel the TV show Cat Cops, it was a bit, you know, 21st Century Fox, a big corporation with a sort of um, infamous leader. And, you know, talking to their PR folks and their other folks who were going back and forth with us, we had kind of had them on the ropes around the campaign and they offered to diversify the sort of uh, communities they went in. And basically that was sort of code for, we won't go into as many black communities, we'll go into poor white communities because they, um, and I told them, I was like, if you're saying that you're gonna go into more poor white communities and that's gonna make us feel better then you've picked 
the wrong racial justice organization. Because unless you're gonna film the TV show Cops on Capitol Hill or Wall Street, where actual crime happens at a deep structural level that we know hurts people in deep ways, and I'm not interested in you continuing to go into communities that are already under attack, that are already targeted. And so what I say about sort of all of this right work is, is that corporate power, um, that, does, that the sort of history of policing to protect corporations, to protect property, to um, you know protect the slave trade, all the way up to now sort of in a corporate democracy, um, sort of the relationship between police and safety is one that I think we have to integrate because police are not there to keep us safe. Police are here to keep control. And where um, that is the case, we can't just simply put laws around less chokeholds because if the someone's goal is to control you, then they're going to find another way to control you if you um, if you ban chokeholds. And so that's how we got the defund. And that is how it is always connected with technology as we see our police become militarized, as we see them um, operating in some ways like they are sort of dealing with sort of foreign forces um, because that's how Black people are oftentimes treated in our communities as enemy combatants. And so part of this is really reshaping the resources that law enforcement has and right-sizing our vision around what safety looks like for all of us. And so just just on the back end of that, um, obviously I'm, I'm a, a technologist, I'm a nerd, I'm a geek. I'm really interested in, from your perspective, from like a, a rights organization, mm -hmm. How have you seen technology being increasing uh, the cha the changes in technology? It, cha I'm sorry, the changes in technology in terms of the campaigns that you've done. So I opened this conversation saying my entry point um, into this work was through this vigilante killing, right? But this was a person surveilling a person. But as a professional, I did know that facial recognition was being used. I, I always say I thought it was a joke. I thought technology was great. I thought that if we had an app, we would be able to, to um, you know, we, we would be able to diversify the data set or, or you know, somehow solve racism um, through a push notification. But clearly I was wrong. And one of the things that I'm really interested in is as you've had to advocate for these different campaigns in terms of police, how have your tactics had to change to uh, respond to the new technology? Because there probably wasn't a stingray, right, in 2005 yeah. with Katrina. Um, so I'd yeah. be, I'm fascinated about that. So, you know, I mean, this is really one of the biggest challenges of constantly trying to keep up. Um, inside of a, a marketplace where the incentives to uh, fast track new policies, fast track new products um, is so um, is so deep. Uh, racism is like water pouring over the floor with that has holes in it. It will always find the cracks. It will always leak through. And so part of how I've tried to approach this is while we have to deal with a lot of one-offs day-to-day with various companies, while we have to deal with one-offs with different municipalities as things are implemented, if we don't get strong federal standards um, around sort of what, um, how these companies are related, relating to uh, technology and policing, then we're just gonna continue to play, be in this game of whack-a-mole, that game at the carnival where something pops up and you hit it down and something else pops up. And while you're hitting that thing that's popped up, five other things have popped up. And so we are actually in a place where I feel like um, in order to keep up, we actually need standards. We need infrastructure in this country that can um, deal with it. The hearing today where um, technology CEOs are going to Capitol Hill, um, to testify on antitrust is, an, is, I think, a perfect illustration of sort of all the ways in which so many of these companies that are at the sort of center of some of the challenges from the sort of social media platform like Facebook to um, Amazon and the role in facial recognition, all of these companies that the sort of incentives around profit and growth um, will trample over civil rights, trample over any sort of um, sort of beliefs in the sort of ability of everyday people, regardless of who they are, to be protected um, inside of a, a democracy. And so, part of what we have to do is get to new standards. 
At the same time, we are dealing, because we don't have the political levers right now, we are dealing with sort of a set of strategies that have to be about exposing problems when they arise, working to channel corporate power and hold corporations accountable, working to where we can um, get rules implemented, working with those who are engaging in the courts. All of these things are sort of, um, um, you know, things that we feel comfortable doing um, um, as long as we are building the, the bricks, building the house towards the type of long-term change that makes it so that we are not playing, um, we're, not, we're not chasing various issues, but we're able to make sure that the systems we put in place are actually enforcing the problems as they arise. So um, you've just made my morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're where you're watching us from, because so much of my work, specifically around facial recognition, but also around um, in information integrity, disinformation, and misinformation, li originates in the work that I did um, in Congress, actually, as an mm -hmm. as an advisor, and being part of that team that introduced the biometric barriers. Um, Act, which was the only one to be in, introduced to the U.S. House of Representatives during this particular Congress, and as well as uh, deep fakes accountability. But what we were asking for in all of those bills was this idea that we have the 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 civil, not just the civil rights, but really the human rights, the constitutional rights that are laid out to American citizens are applied to these technologies as well. And one of the things that struck me in your response was just last week, I was on a panel with the UN Special Rapporteur for Racism, Tendaya M. Achime, who was in the opening uh, ceremonies for RightsCon. And she's just, uh, she's just released a report called Techno Racism. And what that did was give a global perspective of how, in many ways, we think about the Uyghur in China in terms of facial recognition. And we also think about black populations and false detection. I'm thinking specifically a case that the ACLU in, in uh, Michigan currently have, where an African-American man was wrongfully arrested using facial recognition. They put his picture through a camera and uh, misidentified him because they thought all black people look alike. Hopefully all you guys in the audience can see I, me and Russia, Rashad is him and we are separate people. Mm -hmm. But he hadn't been at that store since 2014. And, and he could prove that, that he literally had not been in that place. And you know they're gonna be able to use geolocation data on his phone to confirm. That's a very, very long way of me saying me too. I agree with you. We do need standards. And I guess leading into my next question about movements, because I think AI for the people are very, very, very concerned about standards and stories and changing those mm -hmm. and then working with other organizations that are concerned with movement. And from our vantage point, we really credit the movement for Black Lives for providing a platform by which people could say, not just that Black Lives Matter, but then linking Black Lives Matter to the use of facial recognition in police, which ultimately then led to a bill that we were able to, that we were able to influence because we had already written the statute. That is an even longer way of me to ask. In terms of color of change, that thousand people is now five million people, I believe. I am one of them. I look seven. out for your text. Seven. Tell me. Yeah. You, seven million people. I am one of them. I, I actually yeah. look for your texts to tell me mm -hmm. what to do. And as soon as, um, mm -hmm. as, soon as I'm not overprotecting my 13 year old, I am going to introduce yeah. him to your text. So there's this generational, you know, there's this generational expectation that the way that we organize is through through this particular mm -hmm. organization. But how can that seven uh, million people who want to do right, who want to do right by black people, really be activated in this moment where we're seeing the movement of black lives being a, a pressure too? Yeah, so I mean, a couple of things. First, you know, we've, we are obviously trying to uh, electoralize this 
issue as best as possible, although it's complicated. We're trying to uh, work this into the ways in which uh, political leaders who are running for office from the very top of the ticket on down are sort of including these issues in terms of their platforms and their planks. Um, and then we're also running this campaign called Beyond the Statement, which we're sort of in the early phases of, which is really about pushing these big companies across many sectors from tech companies to Hollywood and elsewhere to um, move beyond their sort of hashtag statement of support for black lives to the sort of structural uh, things that they will do both internal and then external with their go-to-market strategies to really put some, um, um, rigor and some accountability around statements um, of support for Black lives um, that don't coincide with the uh, sort of behavior change or engagement change of the company. And so, you know, that right for us means that we actually have to have people in motion. We have to have Black folks and allies of every race with us, uh, part of our relationship uh, to uh, mobilize uh, folks in those moments. And if we have sort of those relationships, we can sort of be in a place where we can build more, more power and more, and more engagement. The other thing I will say um, that I think is sort of related to all of this is that, you know, and I, I kind of touched on it a second, but I want to like hit a finer point around it. There is this way, especially around AI, that I sometimes hear people think like, oh, we'll just make the technology better. And if we make the technology better, then we will solve for the problems. Um, and the thing I want to push back on is that even if we make the technology better, we have to think about how technology is applied over imbalances of power, right? And so even if you sort of in certain types of policing, let's say in New York, uptown New York, where I live, I live a stone's throw away from Columbia University and a stone's throw away from Central Harlem. And uh, although Columbia University is taking over sort of all of Harlem now, but, you know, the main Columbia campus. And so... No one can tell me that there's not just as much drugs being done on Columbia University's campus as there is in Central Harlem. We know who gets arrested, who gets tracked, who gets, who, who gets harmed for it. And so I just say that to say that simply changing gun laws without changing policing doesn't actually get you to a better sort of lived experience. And that, I think, from a perspective of people who think about rights, right, um, when you overlay race, you can't just think about the written rules, you have to think about the unwritten rules and you have to uh, target your engagement around those things. And that I think has been the very sort of important piece of the Black Lives Matter movement is a specificity around what does it mean to have um, racial justice at the center of your policy making. And when you do, you're able to build policies that address um, not just the sort of um, written written letter of the of the problem, but the actual lived experience of the problem. Right, right. And I I would um, just add to that. I I didn't mean to amen as you were speaking, but I, you know I was catching the spirit because I I do I do completely agree with you. But we saw this in Ferguson, right? We saw that one of the major problems in Ferguson were the municipalities in St. Louis County were using police stops to fund to to fund public services. And when we did when we looked at that data, we found that black people were 11% more likely to be st to be stopped than white motorists. And the the and if you couldn't pay your fine, you went to jail. And so that is an example of um you know what we would think about as disparate impact, right? A police stop is a police stop. It's just that you your taillight was broken. But then if you're targeting this particular group, not just in terms of criminalization, but there's this economic um, impact, then that to me is what I call the technology of anti-Blackness. Anti anti so just to um, start to turn the conversation a little bit, because you have alluded to this, and I, it's... It's one of the aspects um, of your work that I love and I hate at the same time, but it's so important, is your corporate strategies. So, uh, you know, I, I sit in my apartment in Brooklyn and I'm like, why is he gonna eat dinner with Mark Zuckerberg again? This is a, this is a you know, a bloodbath. We need to come with guns. We need to come with, but luckily <laughs> I'm not you. 
and I don't have that access. And so you are more effective. But I'm wondering whether you can, without giving away all your secrets, kind of walk us through what that what that corporate accountability strategy looks like generally. Really let us know why it's important. I'm very famous for uh, saying that racial justice equals economic justice. And until yeah. we have both, you are not helping black people. And I, you know, I'm on the record of saying that does include reparations for African for for descendants of enslaved people. I think that that's really important. And as you're walking us through, and this might be nine questions instead of one, but as you're walking us through, I really want us to get into stop the hate because that's one of the major reasons I showed up. Like I. Um, I'm overstretched and overtired and um, doing a lot of work. So I'm not really getting into the details of things. And I would love for you to just let me and the audience know uh, more about that campaign in the context of your greater corporate accountability work. Yeah, I mean, so we fundamentally believe at Color of Change that you um, can advance racial justice without dealing with corporate power. And that corporate power in some ways is such a, a force that stands in the way. You know, I actually interviewed for our Voting While Black podcast um, that actually won a Webby Award uh, for Best Political Podcast. But we, during my Voting While Black podcast, I um, interviewed each of the presidential candidates, many of them. And, um, and what we did was we had a conversation not just about the what, in terms of their list of policies that they want to move, but the how. Because the thing is, is that far too often we'll get a list of proposals from even sort of left-leaning candidates, but they won't tell us how they're going to achieve it. And they certainly don't tell us how they're going to deal with the forces that stand in the way of the type of economic and political progress that Black people need, which is oftentimes the biggest barrier are corporations, um, right? You know, the you can send all the water bottles to Flint that you want, but unless you're going to clean the pipes, you're not going to actually have the sort of long-term need. And the reason why they don't have clean pipes is because a tax policy that has let a corporations off the hook from paying their fair share, that has put cities and communities, particularly Black cities and communities, on austerity in the richest um, uh, country in the world where billionaire, where many billionaires exist, but then people don't have like clean water running into their sort of houses. And that is not an unfortunate accident like a car accident. It is manufactured. And that is why corporate power is so important to us. And it's why we're the only national Black civil rights organization in the country that does not take corporate financial support. That is a very tricky decision to have sort of in any environment where you're raising money. But even as the uprisings of George Floyd happened, many big corporations were announcing these big checks, the color of change. And I was waking up in the morning being like, well, they're not I don't know how they're giving us this money because we don't take it. Um, and, um, and sort of having to introduce ourselves to corporations that we had previously maybe run campaigns on but didn't have CEO level con relationships. Our relationship with Facebook is unique in that um, we have been back and forth with Facebook for five years. And in many ways we had you know pushed for a civil rights audit. We had done a lot of different things that um, sort of helped to kind of um, amplify the challenges with Facebook, which in many ways started with issues around policing, the doxing of Black Lives Matter activists and people, even from law enforcement, showing up to folks' homes, the um, uh, which Kareen Gaines, a Black woman in Baltimore, had her Facebook Live turned off because the police asked Facebook to turn it off while she was in a police interaction. She ended up dead shortly afterwards with police having one story and it not being sort of completely being able to back up with all the sort of visible facts. Baltimore has recently moving in, I think, to settlement of multi-million of dollars to the Gain to Kareem Gaines's family. Um, and so all of that sort of, all of these are sort of issues of how we got into it. But in 2000, and, um, late 2018, sort of in the height of some of the um, uh, back and forth we've been having after Facebook had already agreed to a civil rights audit, after they had announced it and they announced it sort of with a conservative audit that would be um, done by John Kyle, a, US, a former U.S. senator who has a history of racist and homophobic sort of work. But they once again put 
this idea of conservative bias, which is a tax on conservatives because of what they believe on the same level as a tax on black folks, LGBT, women, um, racial, other racial ethnic minorities for who they are. And they put those things on the same sort of scale because conservatives have weaponized this idea of conservative bias inside of Facebook. And that's part of the sort of really chief um, challenge I have with Mark Zuckerberg is that he continues to make decisions thinking he understands civil rights and he doesn't. He also gets to make decisions that no other sort of corporate CEO in other industries gets to make in terms of not having the type of rules of the road and accountability for a platform and, and, a, and a piece of infrastructure that's so large and has so much influence. But back in 2018, uh, it was revealed by the New York Times that while we were doing this advocacy, advocacy work, that Facebook hired a PR firm to launch attacks on us. And I found out when a New York Times reporter had called me right after they posted the story, they wanted comments on it. And we had to go in and really figure that out. From that point, we moved from like mid-level conversations at Facebook to senior level conversations at Facebook. We've had a lot of back and forth, a lot of meetings. Um, I want to be really clear. I'm at that table and trying to push for some change because we have an election coming up. Do I believe that Facebook can police themselves? No. Do I believe that the federal government is going to give us the laws right now that we need? No. And so we are in a rock, in a hard place in terms of how do we push this company to do the things or at least some of the things that might be helpful in um, preventing some of the type of voter suppression that we saw back in 2016 that makes it harder for my people to vote, that makes it harder for us to cast the ballot. And so in some ways, this is harm reduction work. This is the work that you have to do when you have, when you don't have all the other choices at your disposal um, to sort of move an agenda. But part of this Stop Hate for Profit campaign hopefully for us, is us raising more um, public awareness. When you have social justice organizations working with sort of uh, major corporations that no one would see as social justice warriors, and you have them all saying the same thing about some of the practices of this platform and how large it's gotten, right? Facebook has 2.6 billion users. That is more followers than Christianity. That means... Right. It has a single person that has 60% of the shares that makes all of the decisions. At the end of the day, things about that have to change if we're gonna get to a place where true accountability and civil rights is taken seriously. And in the meantime, we have worked to raise attention on this so that hopefully they will make some changes by the end of August around voting. They've already done some things that were connected to the demands. Um, but, you know, back in June 1st, which was not the last meeting I had with Mark, but the second to last meeting we had over Zoom with Mark um, and Sheryl Sandberg and other folks, we had this meeting where we were going back and forth on the Donald Trump looters and shooters post. We were going back and forth on some posts that Donald Trump had put up around vote by mail that were clearly suppressing the vote. Each of these policies violated the four corners of Facebook's policy. His post, viola Trump's post violated the policy. However, Mark Zuckerberg calls up Donald Trump and has a conversation with him about the looters and shooters post and then leaves it up. You know, I grew up in a small town, 15%, 10% black. I know what it means when the sort of police chief's nephew sort of violates the same rules that the, um, that the black kid down the street violates and the black kid goes to jail and the police chief's kid gets like or nephew gets sort of like a warning or told like don't do it again i understand a world very clearly where they can have a set of written rules but they get applied to different people differently because of who they are and their power and so the part of the problem here on this platform is that these decisions that are being made are deeply consequential and doesn't seem to be any sort of evaluative force to sort of monitor how it's being done. They are also just done through a deep political lens. So Mark Zuckerberg, um, the person who sort of oversees the department that makes these decisions about political posts is a guy named Joel Kaplan. And Joel Kaplan sat behind Brett Kavanaugh in um, during um, his um, um, confirmation for the Supreme Court. Uh, Joe Kaplan was um, you know, famously in uh, Florida during the recount 
uh, for, um, for Al Gore and George W. Bush, one of those folks in the suits that were yelling about uh, um, um, at, at the folks who were recounting and making sure that all the votes were actually counted. Joel Kaplan, if he were alive in the 60s, would have been part of the institutions and organizations that would have made it so that John Lewis couldn't vote. That who right. has, that's who Mark Zuckerberg has decided to put next to him and help him figure out voter suppression. He has put someone that has made a career out of seeing racism as not um, um, a barrier to his participation or engagement with political institutions. And this is the person that Mark and Cheryl have defended to me multiple times when I have said that he should not be involved in this work and that he should no longer be there. And so when I say um, these challenges at these institutions, it's that they um, have prioritized, elevated, and given power to people who have advanced racist causes day in and day out in their lives. And this is why we also see uprisings from staff at Facebook who are right. who understand who Joe Kaplan is. And so I want to say to the staff at Facebook who are maybe watching, we see you and we thank you because the history of civil rights requires people on the inside exposing and pushing back as much as it does the people on the outside. So, th so that's, um, I have a million follow-up questions, but I'm, I'm just going to start with at that point specifically. Um, as I said, I'm one of your 7 million. You text, I do. You text, I filled in my census. You, you know, I, I like you guys for that. You, you keep me, you, you, you keep yes. me doing, doing yes. what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. In terms of tech worker uprisings, um, I, I I live in a district in New York where we have just elected a social democratic state senator, for example. Mm -hmm. And part of that platform was tech accountability um, specifically. And I'm wondering, um, does color of change, how, what you've just said, thank you to the tech workers, but if you are a tech worker right now watching this, what could you do or say from inside your company, outside of your company? How can you become part of this movement is one. And then the second is just to internationalize the conversation slightly. Facebook as a company has 2.6 billion. And I always, um, I always tell my Facebook loving family in Zambia that we have a new Jesus. He's called Mark Zuckerberg. And uh, he puts lots of sunscreen on while surfing. So we have that, Jesus came, he's here democracy but then obviously these are it's not the only company right and all of these companies microsoft ibm all of these companies that have come out and said black lives matter and in this in the case of ibm and microsoft ibm microsoft and um always one i'm forgetting it will come back after the interview and i wish i would have said it but whatever um came out right and said they weren't going to sell facial recognition to the police so how can we, for viewers who don't sit in the United States, what could a color of change-esque like response be if you're sitting in Brazil and saying, hang on, we, you know, we really need to do that too. Or how can they join in to this global color of change network? Yeah. So, I mean, I think a couple of things. I do think that we have to call these companies out um, in very clear ways. We have to find, in some ways, um, the places where the decisions are made inside the companies. We have to do, um, you know, we have to do the work, um, sort of, in my opinion, of also looking at how, of looking at behind the statements that they actually make. And so we'll watch where they'll say, companies may say, we're not going to sell facial recognition anymore to law enforcement, but who are you going to sell it to? And will they then go sell it to law enforcement? Right? We have watched the proliferation of third party vendors, especially in the data space, sort of circumvent um, sort of the some of the civil rights policies and protections around how race data will be shared and then how it will be uh, leveraged and operationalized. Um, in, across housing, credit, um, uh, policing, um, and so much more. And so this is um, 
why um, this has to be a rights-based movement, not just a sort of corporate accountability movement. Yes, we can make corporations better actors and we should be exposing the atrocities, but we need to expose them as a vehicle to get better laws. And, you know, for us, um, I feel a deep sense of responsibility because I recognize the outsized role that America has, the outsized role that Black civil rights can play um, in getting some of these companies to put in place policies that we can then um, use as force multipliers internationally with the recognition that if we force a new normal here in the United States, we can use that hopefully as a vehicle to push elsewhere. That also has all sorts of downsides because of where our politics is right now and all the ways in which um, this sort of uh, relationship to corporate power that um, our government currently has. These companies, right, at the end of the day, care about growth and profit. And so as much as they will make it seem like they are sort of with us on human rights and care about LGBT folks and the climate and racial justice, um, we know that um, it's one thing to say something. It's another thing to continue to do the exact opposite. And what we consistently see over and over again is these companies making statements of support, maybe even personally, the leaders supporting the political candidate for president that I might support, but then watching them do a whole set of things um, that um, make it harder for um, the communities that they say they care about to um, exist and be heard. Okay, um, that makes me that makes me feel good, and we we all have our call, right? This is all of us. We all have to stand together, and I want to I want to move kind of as we're closing out our conversation back to this idea of rights. So I am absolutely famous for every uh, meeting I'm in, particularly those in the human rights community, to uh, really bulk at the idea that the human rights community cares about black lives. And the reason that I say that is in our, often in rights-based frameworks, we think about, we, we don't ever consider the humanitarian crisis of being black in the everyday, right? We don't think about the lived experiences of being over surveilled, being overcharged, being undereducated, being, and it really wasn't until the COVID crisis, at least um, here in the United States and in the United Kingdom, where I'm very conversant of both those um, politics, where we were seeing these racial health disparities and people, white people started to say, Oh my goodness, Black Lives Matter, this, you know, this is a problem. And my preferred frame for what I see in technology is this idea of automated anti-blackness, right? Anti-blackness being a theory of um of extreme violence being visited upon black people just because they're black in the most mundane circumstances. So to, you know, Brianna Taylor is sitting on her couch. For example, yeah. there was another young man just before her sitting on her couch. My question, um, uh, and, and I get pushed back, and I, and I love all of these conversations with my civil rights friends, and thank you, RightsCon, for inviting me, even having said that. But the one thing I will say about RightsCon as an organization is I was really impressed in their opening ceremony when their um, leader admitted that they didn't have this racial justice frame and they weren't putting it. To the, to the front, that they could see the pain in Sudan, but they couldn't see the pain in Detroit and make that make that connection between the way those two black uh, black communities were being um, were being treated. So I'm wondering, as you talk about moving this conversation away from corporate responsibility and moving it into a human rights frame, which is quite frankly more valuable to us because in US civil rights law, the ha you have to be able to prove intent to discriminate. At least in the human rights framework, we can see this idea of disparate in impact where we just look for patterns of discrimination and then we can go in. Um, my question to you from a color of change perspective, because I see how you navigate these worlds between human rights and civil rights. What is this, what is the strategy? What is the strategy there? And for those of us who care about black people and care about black people in all their intersections, disabled, gay, straight, 
poor, not poor, you know, in all of those intersections, what advice would you have for, for us to, to really move this idea um, that it's not about companies, it's about the way we treat black people? Yeah, I mean, I think that you, know, you you said it. And I mean, I think a couple of things that I hear from that is one, I think having the context in the country, having um, leaders who are indigenous to the environment um, at the center of this work is so critically important because you need um, context. And that's where sort of in the, from a US perspective, I kind of oftentimes see the difference between civil rights and human rights. Um, a lot of tech companies will use frameworks around human rights to actually push back against some of the sort of civil rights protections we are demanding because they will sort of prioritize this this, I think, what is oftentimes a misreading of First Amendment, a misreading of freedom of speech principles um, to supersede sort of uh, uh, anti-discrimination laws, um, to supersede sort of other amendments. Um, and, um, and 60, you know, the 65 civil rights law. And so forcing, and so forcing Facebook to recognize that if they're targeting marketing, is excluding women from jobs or excluding black people from housing, then that is not simply about someone's freedom of speech. That is actually violation of other laws. And you have to weigh, you have to have um, a real focus. And there's always a way in which I recognize when something hits black people in a very specific, unique way, there's a way in which there can be an, a reason or an excuse for not people taking it on. And I wanna say this just in the context that you know, as we think about anti-Blackness, I think we have to just continue to interrogate both the language that we use around it and then and how that leads to the type of solutions that we end up with. Because oftentimes we end up starting from a place of how do we help Black people? And if we start from a place of how we help Black people or how do we fix the problems that Black people are facing, then we are, off, then we are already starting from a place where we see Blackness as a deficit and we'll never actually sort of undo all the policies and practices. And so let me just say what I mean by that. We will call Black communities vulnerable. And um, vulnerability is a personal trait. You know, I can be personally vulnerable if I go on social media and I see an ex that's way too happy with their life. Like that's something I need to work out for myself, right? I, like I don't, like that's personal. Um, but um, but if, if we talk about black communities as vulnerable, then we spend all of our time trying to fix black people and black communities rather than fixing the structures that have targeted, um, exploited, um, um, us um, attacked us. And so, you know, we will say things like black people are less likely to get loans from a bank instead of banks are less likely to give loans to black people. We will say black women are less likely to uh, make it to the C-suite of tech companies instead of tech companies exclude black women from the highest level. Right. Once again, we end up with like in the banking scenario, we end up with financial literacy programs for black people instead of actually fixing the systems and structures of banking, which since it's very founding in this country, have excluded, targeted, uh, redlined, um, exploited black people. Um, in the tech scenario, we end up with pipeline programs, mentorship programs mm -hmm. for black women to help black women somehow do better inside of a racist exclusionary system, which has systemically excluded them from the very beginning. And so part of, I think, what I am sort of demanding from and what asking for um, the human rights community to recognize is that when we talk about Black people and we talk about systems that hurt us, we have to talk about the systems in active voice and Black people in passive voice, not Black people in active voice and the systems in passive voice, because it is the systems that are exploiting and targeting us. Because we are not trying to fix Black people, we are fixing and changing and dismantling dismantling the systems that have hurt and targeted us. That is how we get to justice and freedom. Because all of this work, right, at the end of the day, cannot just center Black pain, 
but has to also center black brilliance, black creativity, black joy, which is not the absence of pain, but the presence of aspiration and the presence of what we are fighting for. All around the world, there are movements that have centered themselves and modeled themselves off of the liberatory work of black people here in the US, off of the songs, the chants and the work uh, to fight for a better tomorrow and freedom. So there's nothing about that that is from a deficit perspective. There's everything about that that has actually been focused on making democracy work. Because the final thing I'll just say about it as we head into an election even, is that black people, black Americans, black people in general, are the protagonists in the American story of voting. No group yeah. of people have fought stood on longer lines, faced more indignities to be able to express their will for a better future. No group of people have had to face more indignities, threat of violence to be educated, just to learn how to read. If you sort of look at the history of literacy in this country and slavery and Jim Crow, all of these things have been part of the American story. So we shouldn't be starting our work thinking about how do we help and fix black people, but how do we channel what are not unfortunate stories of, in, of injustice, but unjust stories of injustice? And how do we build the power to actually change the rules long-term? And that I think is how we both make democracy work. And when we make democracy work, then we can build the systems and structures to make sure that technology doesn't exploit um, our holes in our democracy because the water that pours over the floor will find the holes and we have a lot of holes to fix. Oh my God, Rashad, you have just taken me to church, full church. I appreciate you for that. Um, I have admired your work for years because of this and, and, and thank you, thank you for Thank you for putting us in our rightful frame. I think Nicole Hannah-Jones and others are also doing incredible work around framing who we, you know, who we are and the contributions that we've made. So we only have three minutes left. Some of me wishes it was 30 minutes, but I'm tired. So I'm happy yes. that it's three. <laughs> and my final question is really about that. So um, Thank you for this incredible conversation. But in our email exchange prior to us speaking to each other, we actually were sharing quotes of Audre Law because both of us yeah. are very, very tired. And one of the things that I would love for you to help end us on is for other Black people who are doing racial justice work in a moment where the world is looking at the fate of Black people, what advice would you have for them to take their rest and to find their joy? And that's my final question. Yeah, I mean, we, I always say to my staff, I say to myself sometimes, is that this is all a short stop on a long journey, both a short stop on a long journey in our lives, hopefully, but a short stop in a long journey on the life of blackness and on the sort of work to dismantle uh, systemic and structural racism. And none of this will be overturned tomorrow. There's no piece of legislation. There's no silver bullet to changing any of this. Part of this is the, the legacy of work that we are coming from and the legacy of work that we will pass on. But it is about at each phase, I think, passing on something bigger, better, greater, and more open for the generation that comes behind us. And I'm talking about the generation of all races because when we end anti-Blackness, we end so many other of the systemic harms. You know, the final thing I'll just say um, to the people who are doing this work is less, everyone's got their own thing about self joy, uh, about uh, uh, personal care and, um, and all those things. But the final thing I'll just say is that sometimes people will say, we will get um, racial justice and gender justice when we get a true democracy. And I say the reason why we don't have a true democracy is because we don't have racial justice and gender justice. And the norms around our democracy that sort of in its very founding prevented racial and gender justice is exactly what we need to dismantle. So the work that you are doing, if you're feeling tired and you need a break, know that it is part of a legacy of not just ensuring a couple of rights, but it's about figuring out whether or not in a multiracial society, we can build the power structures for all of us to be able to have the things that we need. 
And that type of work is not uh, work that happens in a lifetime. That is work that happens across many lifetimes. And so let's get to work, but also let's recognize that we are part of it. We are not all of it. Rashad, thank you so much for your time. I hope you enjoy the beach and I hope that you get your rest. <laughs> and we appreciate you. you. We appreciate you. Thank you so much, RightsCon. Thank you. Thank you.